and welcome to Board Game Breakfast. Well, what a week this is going to be. Okay, first of all, last week was an amazing week for everybody who donated to the Jack Massell Memorial Fund. For me, a big thank you. We made just shy of $80,000. Someone needs to donate like $400 so we can get there. Just, it's an amazing thing. And so I want to say thank you. I'm so glad uh, that all the different things got sold and just really a cool thing. I hope everyone enjoyed being a part of that. Uh, yesterday, uh, actually today as me recording it, but yesterday when you watch this was Jack's, it was five years since Jack was born. Um, and so that really means something to me there. Um, yesterday also was the registration for Dice Tower Con. I said it would sell out. I did not expect it to sell out in 12 minutes. Nobody expected it to sell out that fast. Now, they did hold some tickets back uh, because I had argued strongly that we should hold some back for people in church. Um, and so then more people were able to get them later on. There are still tickets that exist. The waiting list currently has first priority, um, but they may put them back up for sale, I think, Tuesday night or something around there. Just keep an eye on Dice Tower Con if you're still looking for tickets. If you want to go, get on that waiting list, okay? There's a waiting list there at Dice Tower Con. I am very sorry that they sold out so quick. I mean, I'm a little happy that it's obviously that the convention's that popular, but we do not certainly intend for them to sell out that quick and for the convention to be this popular in a sense. Um, next year, in 2017, we will be more than doubling our space, but this year we are constrained by space. We, are, uh, we went from 1,200 to 1,500, so we went up by 300 people. The next year will go up by 3,500. So again, I apologize. I did say that it was going to sell out, but I had no idea that was going to go that quickly. That is exciting. It will be a good time. And if you want to come, get on that waiting list. Today, I'll be doing a uh, live Q&A at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So I hope to see some of you and talk to you then. And this week, we will be at Board Game Geek Con. Board Game Geek Dot com is the largest website about board games. They have a convention every year. I don't know. This is at least the 10th year that they've done it, which is about board games, people playing board games, and myself, and Z Garcia, and Eric Summerer, and Jason Levine, and uh, Sam Healy. We will be there. We will be doing a live show at 5 p.m. on uh, Friday, so we hope that you guys come by and see that. It's going to actually be a live board game breakfast. We'll be doing Episode 100 there for all those there who are wondering why I had skipped 100. Yes, I know this puts everything out of order, but I find that amusing. Um, so that you can come by and see that. And, uh, well, there will be some other things to see there, but hopefully most of the time we'll be playing games. Now, we really work hard here at the Dice Tower as time comes by, and I really, really want to get things done and put out a lot of videos. But we are essentially shutting down this week. You are going to see this video and our Week in Review video that accompanies it. They both go up pretty much at the same time. And you'll see my live Q&A today. And then that's all the videos you're going to see this week. Um, I, there's, I'm not too upset about that. We put out a lot of videos this year. And when we get back next week and Thanksgiving week, we will start pumping out videos again. We need to take some sort of a break, even though we will be playing board games all week so that we can review more things. Um, and I feel like there's a pretty giant backlog. Go watch some of the stuff we put out last week. There is certainly a lot of it. So anyhow, that's a big long intro. Let's get to the news. Not a ton of news this week. AEG has shown off some new games, Greedy Greedy Goblins. This is a game about goblins getting points and all that stuff. But what intrigues me about this game is that Richard Garfield designed it. Yeah, that Magic the Gathering, that King of Tokyo guy. Um, they also announced Ravenous River from Isaac Shalab. This is a game about rivers. And, uh, and it's, you vote on the rounds and different things. So some interesting things. You can find the rules of that game online. Passport has announced some titles that they're bringing to the U.S. CV, which is an interesting game about uh, living your life and uh, what life would you like to live. CV lets you do that. Apollo 13, which is a great theme for a game. So I'm looking forward to that one. And Antarctica, I've already reviewed that game. Glad to see that one coming to America. 
And then um, Arcane Wonders has announced Starborn. Starborn is a card game in the Dice Tower Essentials line. I got a chance to play this last year. It's been a while before we've been able to announce this one. Very excited about this one. I can't tell you anything about this one except that it's a card game. Um, but you will be able to see a sneak preview of it if you're at Board Game Geek Con this coming Saturday. So go by the Arcane Wonders booth and check that one out. I'm telling you folks, this, this, this card game is going to really be big. You watch. It's cool. It's very impressive. Hey folks, I'm Tom Vassell. Jason Levine. And we have a question where someone asked, they said they were playing a game of Betrayal at House on the Hill and it was going for three hours. And they had a chance to like just die. But they didn't take it, they finished the game. And they wanted to know if we have ever ended a game early because it was so irritating that we deliberately made the game end early just so it would be over. Not deliberately. Um, I know if I'm in games where there's elimination and I'm at the point of almost dying, I might, you know, I might let myself get killed. I'll fight sometimes. It depends if I'm really, really enjoying the game, even if I'm losing, I'll fight. But if I'm like not enjoying the game or not enjoying the company, I'll be like, okay, kill me off. I'm fine with being killed off. Um, aborting a game. The only time we really abort games is if it's so bad that we're like, okay, we're done. Let's not play it. Well, this has happened more times than I can count actually though. <laughs> okay. But I will say that, uh, when we, uh, when I'm playing a game, if I really hate the game and it's dragging on and on and on, and if I can make the game end by doing something, I will consider doing it. If I if it will deliberately make me lose, I wouldn't do it. But if it might make me lose and I'm not really sure and I don't feel like counting up all the points, I will do it. Okay, I will not do it. Also, if it's like a spoiler, like I'll end the game and it'll be you know it's really king close making. between. J I won't king make doing it, but I will end the game or. You know, like if there's a victory condition, I'll be like, all right, let's start, uh, you know, taking these chips. When are all gone, the game's over. Come on, everybody, let's move this game along. But yes. I w it depends on everyone else, too. If everyone else is having a fantastic time, then whatever. Finish it out, even if you hate it. Yeah, because well, it's not up for me to destroy other people's fun. Or, or, you could, or you could do what me and Sam did recently, destroying Tom's fun. And it happens to be the same company that you're talking about, about the pick the pick the chips thing that we just played. We were playing a game a while ago and we could tell Tom was having a bad time and me and Sam were purposely prolonging the game to make it horrible for Tom. <laughs> what? Should we say the game or not? What game was this? Lords and Ladies. Oh yeah, I want to slap you guys upside the head for that one. Yeah, I remember that. That's not in my top. Yes, <laughs> nastiness. So, so yes, Tom was hoping. Tom was like, "You guys should do this to end it." And Sam's like, "No, I want to do this." And I'm like, "Okay, Sam, I'm with you. Let's prolong it." <laughs> All right. Anyway, I'm Tom Vassell. Jason Levine. Yeah, if you have ideas about this question, you can write them in the comments. Send us questions at dicetower at gmail.com. Jazz Marlar here with Pair of Dice Paradise. And we're in part 37 of our ongoing maxi series about meeples for sheepish. Oh, I'm the guy who just talks about a bunch of pointless statistics about the people's choice nobody cares about? Hey, let's get it over with. Dominion. Is there any game in recent memory that stands out as more important and more stronger of a legacy than Dominion? Okay, fine, except that one. In its heyday, Dominion was impossible to avoid, serving as an introduction a gateway, if you will, to this great hobby of ours. Of course, Dominion came out in 2008, and it seems almost impossible for a game to retain its popularity for seven years. Again, except for that one. And Dominion still is very popular, but it's at number nine now. It used to be ranked at number one, then number one again, then number three, then number four. When I made my votes for the People's Choice, I only voted on games that I played in the last 12 months, and so, honestly, I did not vote for Dominion, because I haven't played it in the last year, which is Kind of surprising for me, because historically, to me, the three Ds of board gaming had always been Dungeons and Dragons, Dixit, and Dominion. Yes, I recognize that as four Ds. Shut up. The problem isn't just that Dominion isn't hitting the table, it's that it isn't hitting, for lack of a better question, the internet. See, unlike Board Game Arena, there is no great implementation of Dominion Online currently. There used to be an amazing resource for Dominion Online called Isotropic. People would play millions upon millions of games on Isotropic. You could drop a game of D in like eight minutes on that site. Isotropic was shut down two years ago in favor of the new official Dominion website, and like I said before, 
There is not currently a good implementation of Dominion Online. So that's what's hurting Dominion's legacy. Also the lack of a dark, gritty reboot. And with that, I conclude my annual analysis of the People's Choice Top 100 Games of all time. But what are Jared's Top 100 Games? Well, I don't think anyone really cares about that. Unless they do. Hello. So I see you have a lot of uh, dominoes here. <laughs> Is it the domino? Um, it's domino, but like the domino chain. Yep. Design, uh, game design. Uh, the idea is like we all put, we will, it's a cooperative game, we all put dominoes standing up. Yep. And at the end of the game, we hope like we just one push from the first one, they are going to all uh, go against each other and falling and give us the best pictures as we, ca as we can and as we wish, yep. as we hope. As we are playing a team of uh, reporters and we are sent to discover Aya, a new world with different landscapes and animals that we try to catch the best, uh, best pictures. Mm. Cooperative, two times ten minutes yep. to get the adventure done. Uh, yeah, so you have to speed up. Uh, you have to speed, but not too much because yeah. it's still, you know, you have to be careful. Yeah. So you have to discuss a lot because in the beginning you all have, we all have dominoes but hidden. So we don't know which kind of domino are going to be shown first. Mm -hmm. And then everyone will have his own and only one at, in, uh, at a time uh, in his hand. And you'll have to say, well, I'm going to have, oh, I'm having a mountain for the next one. So maybe we can open there or that. Uh, oh, I will have uh, one with a camera, a camera with allow you to try either to discover a new landscape on the, you know, you have a, a different type of, yeah, this kind of desert, a new kind of lens, a new landscape or an animal as well, depending on where you are and what you think is the most pertinent at that time. Uh, so it's very important to discuss, to say what we are going to have next then because it can change the, how the other ones are playing and setting. So you have to speed, yes, but talk and don't speak too much neither. Uh, so it's, uh, yeah, yeah it's, it's, sure. it's kind of intense and in the same time, like, uh, it's intense because, yeah, you have to, you kind of stress in the way of, uh, for the speed, but for the, to be calm as well and not to make them fall and, uh, yeah, of course. So, so I'm the co-designer of the game and that's really something, I've been playing a lot, uh, Domino Chain when I was a kid and I've discovered that there were no real board games using this kind of game design and so we have been working for months trying to find something that could work and be really uh, to, to have the same feelings as we had when we were kids but it's something that we all have as adults as well like I've seen so many like in the hundreds of parts we've done before and test the pleasure of the second where adults are just pushing the thing and say wow yes. when it's it's it really works like uh, yeah it's a lot of fun yes. yeah it's yeah, yeah. yeah and it's a really family and and friends game yeah so when I looked at this I was oh this is interesting <laughs> it really catches the eye yeah, I hope so. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. We did a big work with the graphists as well, trying to be realistic, but not too much neither, but the most is possible. And yeah, we'll see. Like, it's a bet, really, because yeah. this game is a bet, because I have no idea how people will react to that. And but it looks really great. And thank you very much. It's good. Thanks for me. So good luck with uh, thank you the very much. adventure. <laughs> Thanks. Not a lot of videos from us coming out this week. So if you have if you need a fix of different things to see, of course, go to dicetower.com and check out the Dice Tower Network. There's always new podcasts going up. We've had a new podcast join the Dice Tower Network, the Dukes of Dice. You've seen them on Board Game Breakfast itself sometimes. So there is that. Uh, and of course, like I said, a huge backlog of videos. And you can find all of that at dicetower.com. Oh, and one more thing. If you did not get a chance to, Go back last week and watch our live playthroughs of Time Stories. Of course, only if you've actually played through it, but it's a lot of fun. We're getting our, li uh, not our live playthroughs, I guess, but our recorded playthroughs. You're going to start seeing a whole lot more recorded playthroughs coming from the Dice Tower because we're starting to get that kind of down as it goes by. We're currently recording the next set of Time Stories, but we'll be doing other games too that don't have spoilers so that you can watch them. All right, let's move on. Marler from Pair of Dice Paradise here, 
and my previously scheduled segment, Games to Play While Analyzing Capital Communication Policies in DC, will have to wait because I received a question. It's wacky wit, by the way. A viewer writes, I'm struggling because the group of friends that I game with only wants to play Uno, Apples to Apples, and Dominoes, and I no longer enjoy those games. My friends are intimidated by games like Dominion, Dixit, and Ticket to Ride, but recently everyone agreed to play Risk Legacy. But then, midway through our first game, they all lost interest. What do you think? <laughs> what do I think? I think that that's actually a pretty heavy question, so honestly, I hope I can do it justice. First, if your friends do try another game that they're currently intimidated by in the future, you could try playing it with a shorter end trigger the very first time. For example, set the goal in Dominion to fewer victory points. Secondly, you mentioned that they lost interest. Well, try asking them specifically what it was about the game that made them lose it. Maybe there's a similar game out there that still provides the same atmosphere, but with a different enough approach that it can be enjoyed by everyone. Another example, I personally dislike the game Bang because its icons confuse me and it has player elimination. But I really like Samurai Sword, which uses the same Bang engine, but has simpler icons and no player elimination. So everyone gets to play the entire game. And finally, it sounds like your situation calls for mutual communication, respect, and experimentation. Maybe have everyone list five games they like to play on slips of paper and then put those into a hat, like, you know, a bowler or a derby. A cap would also work, as well as an oversized novelty sombrero. And then randomly draw and play one. Then immediately afterwards, have the group discuss what they liked and disliked about the game. Then continue this, a top hat would also work, until every game someone has submitted has been played. Now this can help introduce new games to people who never would have tried them otherwise, some of which they'll hopefully discover that they really like. Well, I genuinely hope that this helps. And if any viewers out there have any additional suggestions for Adam, I invite you to post them in the comments below. Until next time, take care and good luck with your gaming group. Hey, welcome to Painting 101. Today we're going to be learning how to make our own flock for bases. Let's get to the table and see how it turns out. So the things that you'll need to make flocking is a good container that you can mix with, a mixing stick, a good cheap color paint that you want to use. You can use any kind of paint, uh, price doesn't matter. I use a nice acrylic because it dries quickly and I just pick the color that I want. And of course going down to your local hardware store and getting as much sawdust as you possibly can. And they give it away for free. You add, you sift through and a sifter. Make sure that you get yourself a sifter. You can go to any uh, Dollar General and you can pick one up for two dollars. So all this together costs three bucks and we could probably make a couple hundred dollars worth of flocking. First thing you want to do is go down to your local hardware store and just get sawdust because you want to get all those big particles out of there. So there we've got a pretty good amount in there just to start with. Right now for just green I'm going to do green. You're going to want to shake it up and then all you're going to want to do is just put a good amount in. You can see I'm just putting it in there. And then I'm going to take my stick and just move it around. Now I have a, a sealed container that I keep to keep the moisture out. And then you j I've already had some that was dried and then you want to just sift through it one last time. And it's as simple as that. And there you go, an inexpensive way how to make flock. For an extended version on how to do sand and even more flocking in different colors, go to my channel, Rob Orn. Till next segment. I'm Rob Bourne, and we'll see you soon. All right, folks, today I want to talk a little bit about this uh, exclusivity thing about conventions that can happen. Now, 
When I first got into board gaming, the convention to go to was the Gathering of Friends. This was currently held in Columbus, Ohio, and Alan Moon, designer of Tickets Ride, Union Pacific, many other great games, basically had a gathering of his friends. It was an invite-only convention. And it was a convention that I looked at every year like, oh, I wish I could go type thing. But I wasn't able to go to. I mean, I was actually invited after a few years, but I just could never go because of the time. And a lot of the internet watched it and basically all said together, oh, we wish we could go. But somewhere along the line, I'll probably credit Board Game Geek with starting this. Other conventions where you went and played a ton of games started popping up. Board Game Geek Con, uh, Geek Way to the West, and other cons. Now we have a whole pile of these cons all over the place. And so this whole, oh, I wish I could go type thing isn't really existing right now because people have places they can go and play games. But what do you do in this circumstance? And I'm curious to hear your feedback on this because it's the same for a gaming group and it is the same for a convention. Now, I want to promote gaming. I want everybody to play games if possible. If you're not interested in games, that's fine. I'll move on to the next person. But I like to be a sort of a game evangelist to tell people about how great it is to play board games and you should check some of these things out. But um, at the same time, there's certainly the case that some people are more fun to play games with than others. Maybe not, not necessarily the person themselves, but for you. There are certainly some people that you enjoy playing games more. There are some people that I've met at gaming meetups that are kind of like, eh, I don't know if I have that person in my house. And I have not had some people to my house. See, when you have people over to your house, it's kind of this exclusive thing. I am picking people who to invite. I can't usually, you know, like when I have a meetup at the Cool Stuff Hollywood or the um, Sunshine Adventure Gaming Store or wherever I'm going to have these meetups, I will invite anybody and everybody, right? You can come to these, these meetups. Come on out. And as long as you are not being a problem for the group as a whole, you're welcome to be there. When I invite people to my house, so I want to invite the people who I have the most fun playing with. Now, that's what people will do with their, their, and many people's gaming groups are built that way. You've come, and it's me and my good friends, and then someone wants to join, and we check them out. Okay, they can come, and they grow that way, and their groups of close friends. <sighs> Here's the deal. I can see both sides of this, right? I can see the side where you sit there and go, I really only want to have people I have fun with. If I have people over who are not fun to play with, that is kind of a big waste of my time. And, and I'm spending a lot of time that's simply not fun. That person takes forever on their turns, or that person's just kind of really annoying. Uh, this person's kind of a creeper. Whatever your reasons may be, people sit there and go, I don't really want to spend time with people that I don't enjoy. And so when they have their gaming get-togethers, they want to be exclusionary for that purpose. On the other side of the coin, that exclusionary can easily turn into snobbishness. Like, well, that person's not one of us. And almost to the point where there's disenfranchised people out there who really want to play games. And these people have been rejected by many aspects of society. And gaming is a place where they are welcomed. Well, not by these groups. That's tough, right? I've solved that problem, for me, by making the big groups that I have, anybody and everybody is welcome to play. And then sometimes I'll play games in my house, and then I will pick those who I play with, and I try to do both. That way I feel like I'm growing the hobby, and at the same time also having these people who are a lot of fun to play with. Now how does this tie into the Dice Tower Convention? The Dice Tower Convention, we never really expected it to get that big. Sure, every time I drive through Orlando, I point to the Orlando Center and tell my wife, Someday, that's where I want to be. I want it to be that big and that huge and have 10,000, 20,000 people. But I never really expected it to be that way. Our first year when we had 300 people, it didn't sell out for the longest time. Getting people to go out of their way to some uh, uh, convention based on some podcast that some people listen to. And we have grown a little in popularity and the convention, which do thanks to Patrick Havert and his staff, um, Heather Mann and the rest of them has also grown, and so that's very exciting, and now it sells out, obviously, super quick. And some people have said, well, what about the people who already come? They should have first jump on next year. Now, that sounds logical, right? I came to Dice Tower Con 1, I came to Dice Tower Con 2, I came to Dice Tower 3 and 4, I should be able to come to Dice Tower Con 5. And that sounds all well and good, but 
If we do that, we run the risk of being exclusionary. Now, I know some people have no problem with that. They're like, I don't really care. I don't really care if the board game hobby grows. Boo to you, I say. Shame on you. Okay? We want the hobby to grow. This is exactly why heavy war games are dying because of so many people who are in that group. Not all of them, but many people in that group feel that same way. That's nonsense. Okay? We want people to grow. I want kids. That's why I love having kids being able to come to a convention. Maybe not all the time because we want to have times, you know, when there's not kids around. But we want kids to come because we want to grow the hobby. We want females to come because we want to grow the hobby. All right? And so that's... Ah, I want the hobby to grow. But the people who already came were like, oh, come on, we came when you were small. Now we should be there to make. And I certainly understand that point of view. But if we make it, let's say there's 800 people, and then next year we go to 1,000, and all 800 people who wanted to come, who came last year, sign up, and now we can only add 200 new people. Are those people who are just finding out less important because they just got into the hobby? And I don't think so. I really want to grow the hobby. For me, the answer to that solution is to expand. And that is why in 2017, we're going to expand the Dice Tower Con to 3,500. In fact, we would have done it this year. We just didn't have the room for it. Uh, we have a big uh, convention center that's connected to the hotel that we're at that is half being used by another convention, a nun's convention, <laughs> um, which will be entertaining, I think. Um, but th this year, the, well, then in 2017, we'll have the whole thing. Now, some people have come in and said, we don't want it to get big. It will lose that family-friendly vibe. I say to you, why can't it retain that? I fight with people all the time over this. People are like, oh, I want Dice Tower to remain small. You know what? It can be big and still feel like that small con. Case in point, Origins. Origins is, what, 12, 13,000 people? And yet, it, you go there, you meet your friends, you have a good time. We, the same thing can happen with Dice Tower Con. You can go and meet those same people that you've known and get together in groups. Board Game Geek Con is quite large and has that homespun feeling to it. So yeah, just so as a heads up, my goal is to take Dice Tower Con and see that thing get to be one of the biggest board gaming conventions in the world. All right? I, I, really, I really think that can be done. I'm not saying I plan to be, compete with Essen or Gen Con. That, that's never been my goal. But for pure board gaming, we want to make this a great place. For those of us who live in Florida, we want this to be more than just a regional con. We want it to be a great regional con. But we want the people from all over the world to come and play games. And I want them to come and have a lot of fun. That's my solution. But I'm curious what other people think. Maybe some of you guys go to some of these smaller. There's a lot of invite-only conventions that are smaller. Some of them have like five people because that, that come to my cabin in the woods. We'll go play these games. Be careful what cabin you go to. Um, and, you know, other people have maybe 100 or 200 and you have to be on an invitation list. Maybe you like those because you know everyone there and it's, it's a, kind of a fun thing. There's, there's, there are conventions like that. Or maybe you want the one where everybody and anybody can come. It's a tough call. And I'll tell you what, it's a difficult call to make for those running the conventions. I say a lot of this as a place our convention. Remember, Patrick Havert runs the convention. I'm just an advisor of help, and I put my name on the convention. But I really feel strongly about this. I really want to see gaming grow. Gaming is growing. I want to fight against this whole, let's stay together. You can get together in your groups and have a great time. But as an overall thing, and especially in a convention setting, I think it needs to be big and open. <laughs> Hi again, my name is Niels from Cyril's Brettspiele and today we are talking again about my favorite and my worst mechanism for Seven Wonders from Repost Games. Yeah, and Seven Wonders, that is a real classical board game. My absolute favorite mechanism for Seven Wonders is definitely by far that when you're playing with seven players, it's still 30 minutes. There's no additional playtime, no downtime when you add more players. It's the same if you're playing that with three players or with seven players. Four, five, six, always the same time. That is brilliant. And the mechanism that I don't like on Seven Wonders is, well, maybe for you, obviously, it's a card drafting game. Even if card drafting reduces the luck of a normal draw your card game, but still 
drawing seven cards, pick one out of these seven cards and draft that around the table is still a huge amount of luck. This is a huge luck based game and I have to say I don't like it. This is the only down thing on Seven Wonders for me. But on the other hand, it's only 30 minutes and for a 30 minute game, it's good as it is. Let me know your personal favorite thing and your worst thing for Seven Wonders. Tell me that in the comments, send me an email, whatever you want. And yeah, watch it again when it's time for the best and the worst with Niels and Cyril's Beispiele. See you next time. Bye bye. Hi, this is Berkey from Board Game Theater and the Berkey and Badger Board Game Babble Show. Hey, I just wanted to talk a little bit about something Tom talked about in a previous episode. One of the things he was talking about was the top 10 essential for game rooms and then to show gaming shelves. Well, I wanted to give you guys a little bit of an insight to what we do at Board Game Theater. And this is the shelf that we have behind our gaming table. These are where a lot of my favorite games are displayed prominently. Not all of them. But this side of the room, there is a shelf, and this is my shelf of shame. How many of you guys have a shelf of shame? Games that you haven't got to yet that you really want to. Okay, I'm taking you into my room where I actually have another large part of our collection. These are gaming shelves. These are actually entertainment centers that have been repurposed. And you can pick these up at rummage sales for 50 bucks. That's all I paid for this and paid $40 for that one. Look at these great shelves, all solid oak. It's always good to have a dehumidifier in the room depending on your humidity. This is my table that I designed and my dad actually made. For. It's very serviceable with lots of drawers, a few more games of shame that I haven't got to yet. Great drawers that I can keep some of my components, cup holders, the beautiful gaming vault, and I actually have three different removable floors. Just notice these rails, Z Garcia and Tom. I agree with you guys. Tom, a table is one of the most important things. Secondly, Z, you're right. You need a thick rail, this is five and a half inches, so that your hands and your arms comfortably fit on it and give you a good posture. I hope you enjoyed the little time that we had together going through our the backstages, if you will, of Board Game Theater and the Berkey home. And You can go to boardgametheater.com and you can actually see a video of the table being built, which is kind of cool. With that, this is Berkey from Board Game Theater. Let the games begin. Hi, Suzanne here with this week's feature of Board Game Up. I love Uwe Rosenberg games, especially his two-player ones, so I was ecstatic when Lahav Inland Port hit the app stores just a few days ago. Does the app version do Mr. Rosenberg justice? Let's take a quick look. In Lahav Inland Port, two players compete to become the richest merchant in the harbor. This game slims Lahav down to a fairly straightforward resource management game that plays over 12 days of actions of purchasing buildings and using their abilities to increase your resources. The clever resource warehouse mechanic is really puzzly and highly rewards efficiency and thinking ahead, and I love this part of the game. New development shop DigiDice thoroughly impressed me with this app. First of all, the game released for iOS and Android at the same time. Huzzah! Better yet, the game has all the features I want in a board game app, and they're done with polish. Overall, the art and graphics look great. The tutorial is in chapters and is interactive. The interface is intuitive and optimized for touch. And the screen real estate is used very smartly, allowing you to have the important game information available at all times. And it was a surprise to me that this plays well on a phone as well as a tablet. For solo play, there are four levels of AI, and there's a casual online playability, plus a competitive ranked ELO-based game system as well. With this quality work, I hope to see more board game apps from Digidice soon. If you're a fan of Lahav Inland Port in real life, or if you like resource management puzzly type games, definitely give this app a try. Greetings everyone, this is Dean with Board Game Social. I'm here to talk to you today about a, something that really makes my head hurt, and that is political correctness in our hobby. We all know it exists, maybe we take part in it, maybe we don't, but it's out there. And I recently had the opportunity to play a couple of games that I really enjoyed playing. I played them at Grand Con, and that was Two Rooms in a Boom and Mayday Mayday. 
Both of these games have themes that perhaps some people would find to be offensive because they're violent, taking down an airplane, you're trying to blow up the president, things of that nature. But yet they were made. And, and, and I was wondering, that's really interesting. It's really interesting that those games were able to be made because just last year, uh, a game about whaling in the 18th century tried to get funded and the, guy, the designer was lambasted. He was eviscerated on social media about how dare you make a game about killing whales. All right, it's a historical thing, they're whales. I don't get it. I don't understand how we pick and choose. We allow, you know, games about taking down airplanes to be made, but whales, you know, they're, that's taboo. It can't be done. Luckily this year it did fund, so I'm glad to see. But where do we draw the line? Or, you know, I asked my wife, what is it about whales? And, and of course she's like, well, you know, they're, they're, they're gentle giants and they, they can sing songs. I mean, they're, they're really creative. And okay, maybe that's true. Maybe we have an affinity for whales. But, you know, we don't have a problem with whacking little moles on top of the head when they pop their head out of the holes at the arcade. Tell me in the comments below, what is that line you won't cross? Is there a theme or is everything fair game for you? I wanted to tell you guys how you can win this copy of Ashes. You'll just have to check out my YouTube channel, Board Game Social, or Facebook at Board Game Social, and uh, find out how you can win it. Until next time, make sure you check out my upcoming Kickstarter project, Gone Clubbing, the Baby Seal Edition. It's going to be huge, people. Well, lots going on this time. I can't wait to see you guys who are going to Board Game Geek Con. Again, I say this at all conventions. Come up and say hello, <laughs> especially at Board Game Geek Con because I have more free time there and your chance of playing a game with me is high. Although your chance of playing a good game with me may not be so high. I'm bringing a whole pile of games uh, to get played that uh, I don't know if they're good or bad. They might be great. They might not be. So if you find yourself at a table with me, be prepared for anything. I'm certainly going to be trying out a whole lot of new stuff. I might get in a game of Cosmic Encounter because that's only what is good and right. So anyway, if I see you there, come by and say hello. We look forward to saying that hi to you. And Sam Healy and Z Garcia there too. All right, I'll see some of you guys at my question and answer later today. For the rest of you guys, have a wonderful week. I'll see you next Monday. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production. Sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., an amazing place to buy board games. Cool stuff in stock at CoolStuffInc.com.